Good afternoon, one and all present here. Myself, Ekchut Kaur, and I am first year student of Bachelor's of Architecture in GNTC School of Architecture, Ludhiana. Today, we all are gathered here for an online expert lecture for students on art, architecture, and design. Talking about architecture, Master Architect FLW said, the mother art is architecture. Without architecture of our own, we have no soul of our own civilization. An architect amalgamates his skills like art and architecture through his or her design. Today, we have one such expert with us who is an amazing artist, a thoughtful architect, and his designs showcase a profound language. Now, I would like to invite Professor Akanksha Sharma, head GNTC School of Architecture, to welcome our esteemed guest. Thank you, Jyot, and good morning to all. Our esteemed guest, architect Mario, fellow colleagues and students from various institutes, I, on behalf of my school, GNDC School of Architecture, welcome one and all on this important day, where we are going to introspect about the combined role of art and architecture in design. Architect Mario has done his graduation in architecture and master's in design degree from IDC School of Design, IIT Bombay. He is a Khasi lad from Shillong who loves to engage himself in a realm of graphic novels and illustrations. He is currently working as a user interface designer at Tata Consultancy Services. In his free time and on the weekends, he works on self-initiated projects that reflect the indigenous lifestyle of his tribe. Many of them are published in the form of books, novels, and documentary films. He has also has designed a museum of art and cultural heritage, Moflang Sacred Forest, Meghalaya. So we, we as an architecture school are very much delightful today that architect Mario has agreed to motivate our students with his provoking words and delightful piece of art and architecture. Thank you very much, Architect Mario, for sparing your time today for this online lecture. And thank you very much to all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been request the audience to please keep their microphones on mute mode. If you have any kind of query during the session, you may enter that in the chat box. The doubts will be entertained at the end. Now, I would like to request our guest of the day, architect Mario Patha, user interface designer, Tata Consultancy Services, Mumbai, for his expert lecture. Please, sir. Hi. Uh, good morning to everyone. And I'm so delighted and it's such an honor to actually deliver this lecture. And I would like to thank uh, Akamsha Ma'am and Vivek Sir, actually. They were the ones who brought me back when I was uh, doing my bachelor's degree. And then now here, they invited me to be a part of their wonderful college. Uh, as a, uh, an expert in, not an expert, <laughs> but then I'm still evolving in my ways of design thinking. But what I can gather and uh, what I've worked through as through the years, I can actually tell you some of the so as I say, the structure and how to work in, I won't go in depth about how, you know, you will learn a lot in college itself about all the technicalities, but I will share with you about work-wise when you graduate from, uh, from college and how to develop and how you actually collaborate with people. Uh, so without any further ado, I will actually would love to share first my presentation. Um, just give me a second. Can you all share my screen? See my screen? Yes, yes, Mario, it is visible. Okay, um, so first of all, uh, art, architecture, and design. So what comes to mind first when you, see, so about me, I am from Shillong, Meghalaya, and I've graduated uh, my degree in architecture from LP Punjab. That's when I worked as an architect for nearly two years. And then after that, I did my master's degree in the field of communication at IDC 
School of Design in uh, Mumbai IIT Bombay. And that's when after that also I've collaborated with some NGOs and at the same time I'm working as a user interface designer. So here I'm going to talk about, so there are going to be not only an architecture, but it's as a whole as all of these career paths that I've taken. So um, the first question I would like to ask is like, what is art and what is design? Is art design and is design art? So many of you and many people that I've come across also are very confused on this subject matter, whether you know uh, we have art, whether it's design. So I'm going to share your visuals over here. What is art and what is design? So in this picture, can anyone of you understand whether which one is art and which one is architecture? When you see over here, you have the picture of Pablo Picasso, the base of um, from the Egyptian times, and then you see a poster. And as you go on forward, you see uh, hieroglyphics. And you see all of these uh, simplest designs and art forms. Whether you see Frank Gehry or you see any other sculpture, whether can you term them as design or art? And here is one of the indigenous, uh, the, these stones, so as you say, these erected stones for a purpose. So to understand what is art and what is design, the real fundamental thought that you need to keep in mind is that art is a form of expression. And design is when you think of the people around you. For example, let's say a painter can just paint and put it in the museum or an art gallery here. And, they can, and he can say that this is my form of self-expression. It's more than uh, no one can actually, you know, you can judge it according to your own will. But when you actually come to design, it's no longer a self-expression. It's actually you have to think in terms of the user. You have to think in terms of who's going to use your design, who's going to be benefit from your design. So one way to think about design and the way there's no one way thinking of design. Design is always constantly changing. Now, this is actually a, a kind of a vase in my living room. When you think of it, the design of this vase has served a purpose as something that will carry water in the olden days, where, you know, you, you actually back in the olden days, they don't have geyser or anything. They put the water there and they actually boil the water there to take a bath. But as time went by with the development of geysers and other forms of products, this vase became other use, like a decorative piece in a living room. So this is the mind thought that students and other designers need to have that design thinking, there's no one way thinking. So even in this term, time of COVID-19, you've seen that many spaces in architecture has changed its purpose. You've seen that some schools, some churches, gurudwaras have been changed into care facilities. And that's when you think of this flexibility and the way of there's no one way in thinking of how to design a space, how to design a product, how to design something that will last for a very, very long time. Now, uh, before we go in depth, I would like to point out some notes that we are going to talk more on concept development for the students. Because as I was talking with uh, Vivek Sir, he was the one who was like, oh, we need some inspiration for, for the students in order to develop all of these ideas before, uh, you know, thinking about, when you think about technicality, AutoCAD, Rivet, or anything, you can learn that on, on any, uh, you know, platform. But in order to understand design thinking, you really need experts and teachers and people who have been in the field to actually cater and actually nurture you. So the uh, concept development that we're going to talk about now is that we're going to talk about how word and images, they, can, they have a relationship and typographical inspiration for design and user studies and the application. And application-wise, we're going to talk in all of these aspects, uh, from word and image to actually user studies, how we can apply all of these things. So if any one of you don't understand what is typographical, typographical is like, uh, so as you see, when you see fonts and everything and how you can express them. So over here, when you look at Images nowadays, you see lots of memes, you see lots of 
all of these, uh, so as you see, pictures on the internet. And why do they bombard our social media so much? Because you don't need to be, a, you know, a Van Gogh, Michelangelo, or great artist, Raja Ravi Varma, to actually learn how to sketch so much. That's long, but over here you can develop stick figures in such a way to actually talk or send out a message or your thought process. Over here, I wanted to see show students. This is what is this? This is just a cat behind a table pole. So when you see this picture, it's nothing. You can just literally describe that as a cat behind a table pole. There's nothing else. But as you, when you put text, for example, here, when I see my ex in public, you can actually relate to the picture. Or when you see your project guide in the campus, when you haven't finished your projects, your deadlines, meeting and everything, you actually hide from your teachers. So when you add a picture and you add text, that carries out a lot of information. There are many people who actually doesn't necessarily mean that the person has to be a, you know, a student behind the, the campus pool, but it can be a cat behind the pool, but then they can relate and has its relevance. So relevance plays a very important role in our, in our culture now. We have people from all walks of life and everything has been passed down from one generation to another generation in accordance to the situation that they are in, the engagement that they are in. For example, now in COVID times also, there's a lot of things that has changed. Everything, design, the ways of thinking and everything. So according to, I'm going to go a little bit on Kasi Folk Tales also, in which I'm specialized in, where we have a lot of things. The words and imagery play an important role. You look at the, the Kasi uh, script or they do not have a form of writing. They record all of these things in the form of hills and natural beauty and everything. So when you see all of these uh, waterfalls, they all carry a hidden story behind all of them. Why do we have all of this? Because they actually govern the social structure of the land. Now, when word and imagery play, plays an important role over here, the culture they actually uh, they hold this custom where they seek uh, blessings or any form of supernatural intercession from egg divination. If you understand egg divination, is like where you seek signs and uh, answers from God through the through all of these uh, natural resources. Example in egg, where you sacrifice it and actually learn about the signs and everything that needs to be done in nature. So when you see about all of these things, these actually tales and narratives actually plays an important role in design, in designing of each and every aspect from, from house design to social structure to everything. Now the Kasis, they believe in all of these things where you know you have the egg, egg is a form of egg divination. Now when you see that the, the, the design or the deconstruction of their houses they have this form where they believe that the egg, just like the egg protects the developing embryo, the baby inside, is the same way where a house is designed, where the, the, egg, uh, the, the house actually protects the people living inside and nurtures them. And when you look at the geographical state of Meghalaya, they have this uh, for, uh, high wind velocity. And that's when the structure becomes very aerodynamic. Now, all of these actually scientific principles that they have are not associated, you know, they don't have really uh, facts and figures about why they do this, but they, they associate with narratives, they associate it with different forms of folk tales and rituals and beliefs in order to govern the social structure of the land. Now, when you think of imagery, this is a kitchen scene that I sketched for a book. And you see the ways that uh, imagery and words play an important role where you have, it's written one evening as my grandmother was preparing dinner and then my uncle was fast asleep. The texts are actually aligned in accordance to uh, the, the actions that they're doing. Now, how you can actually inculcate in this also, you see in this picture, 
what is important to note is that the detailing of when you go or visit any form of house, be it conservation architecture, indigenous architecture, you need to understand who plays an important role. That is the people living inside the building, inside the house. What are the daily use that they do? What are the things, what are the, 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 their occupation? You can understand from all of these forms where you know you have the daily food, you have these baskets, you have all of these traditional fruits and traditional nuts. You can understand that these, the occupation is basically that they are farmers. And you can understand on the little detail on understanding when was this house created and everything through certain detailing in the, in the year and everything that is around them. Now, expressive typography. When you think about expressive typography, it's like having a form of expression through letters. When you see uh, this word emptiness, you see that the M and the T is actually is, is missing, right? And there's this sense of emptiness in this whole word itself. And this can actually, they have actually helped architects and designers to actually evoke this feeling into the, the market, into the public, into the masses. When you think about negative spaces and uh, all of these void spaces to actually evoke the sense of, of, of this theme that they're carrying, even in, over here when you see missing also, two eyes are missing, but then your mind and your perception, you can see that the, you can actually read it saying that I is missing, but I can read the word, it's, the, the word is missing. But this perception that you have or this tingling effect on your brain that has that you, there's something missing in this in this psychological or cognitive load in your in your mind. Many architects like Tado Ando and everyone have actually used typography as a form of expression in design, in which students also can understand when you actually get conceptual ideas. For example, a theme for for hospital, for mall, for anything, you can actually just deconstruct just one word and actually develop your, your concept from that. You don't need to go in depth in so much, you know, uh, there's a lot of, you have to give so much onto the plate. You can just narrow it down to one word and actually develop your, your, uh, your concept and eventually it become design. So over here also, I would like to point out where you have the data collection. Over here, there's a monolith. You have the data collection. This is, this is from the one sacred forest in Meghalaya, and then you have, that's when you deconstruct into art, and you take all of these visual elements, you have, you have three stones erected and one horizontal stone that lies down flat. And then you, since monolith and Maubinna, they, they, they start with the letter M, so you, you deconstruct it to, to basic shape. And from there, you can actually, you can actually uh, deconstruct it further to have a concept for your design. And when you think of data collection, for example, here, the way you represent data is very, very, very important. How you can communicate to the masses, how you can co communicate to people, because when you are in the design field, you are not only talking to designers, you are talking to people from every walks of life. People will not understand design. People will not understand art. People will not understand architecture. But how as you as a designer can actually help them understand. So when you actually introduce a project or anything else, it's better to, be, to start it from the roots, from the data collection where the location takes place. And instead of having all of these uh, you know, uh, geographical maps where it's very rigid and very formal, you can actually have a play in your, in your forms of representation. Where you where the, the people cannot be you, they can be you can hook them up with all of these illustrations the Meghalaya and the East Kasi Hills district and within the East Kasi Hills district we uh, we have different forms of provinces which are known as Hima and when I went here uh, to study the architecture and the indigenous practices over here, I actually narrow it down to one of the kingdoms, one of the provinces, and that is the Hima Khairam. 
Now, what we need to understand when you actually design a project or you come to have a presentation is how you, you, you present or communicate to the audience. When you think about the state formation, let's say we have this, uh, you have collected all of the data, but how are you going to tell the, this is, uh, this is something valid, these are some, th some points that I want to share with you before, before we step into uh, the, the design phase. So there, there, you have to just jot it down, small, small things that you observe during the data collection and actually represent it in a very uh, visual appealing way. Where over here also what I did in my data collection is that we have the Kasi state formation. And this Kasi state formation happens in four stages, where we have the first one, we have the Kur, which, is, which belongs to, which means that you have the clan, that is the family. And then these groups of families or the Kur, they, 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 they make us put it together collectively and they form a political unit. And that's when they call uh, the political units, they call a right. and then and when all of these uh, political units are actually um, merged in together, they become a kingdom or a province. Now, I actually had this visual representation of how the movement of my data collection went from Shillong City to actually this village in the sacred forest and every part, uh, you know, below the East Kasi Hills district. Now over here also when I uh, went to, for my studies, I actually contacted the people there who are well uh, informed about this form of practice. Now when you go into the field of data collection in terms of art or architecture, you should understand that you shouldn't be too close, to, your mind shouldn't be too close to just one form of studies because uh, let's say there'll be other forms of uh, that the person or the, the user or the person who's giving you all the data is going to tell you so many things. He or she is going to tell you so many things. But it's, it, you should accept it all because you should be very intellectually free and gather all of these information, irrespective if it's architecture or the cultural or if it's uh, other forms of practices. Now, over here also, when I was collecting data, I, I got the information about where these people during uh, they, they don't even uh, when they make they construct a house or anything they have this form of communication uh, using only bamboo threads uh, they, they weave all of these uh, bamboo uh, fiber and in the form of threads and these threads they're like encrypted messages you know now that we see whatsapp we see it's like is it encrypted uh, is, is is there any privacy of what i'm sharing on there on the digital platform. But this is the same that goes with these uh, bamboo threads. They are made and they are sent to carry out a message. Now these forms of threads are actually used to actually tie uh, annually when they rethatch the house of this ancestral home in Smith. They use the same thread to actually, to actually weave all of these, all of these uh, bamboo messages. These bamboo messages carry a certain information, a set of information for this festival known as Bonglang Festival. They are weaved by this group of people, that group of men who are known as Duhaliyas. Now these Duhaliyas are musicians who are, who are very, uh, the executive member or the, the main celebrants or the main uh, musicians of the festival. The the uh, the the kirwas, as you see the the bamboo thread, they carry different sorts of uh, information that goes to the accounting of the goods for the sacrificial uh, goods and what type of goods they should carry and the markings on the doors in the architecture that governs the, the whole ancestral home, which markings does it denote spot and which side of the marking denotes. The, the, the markings of the royal family. And these also plays an important role in actually the, the final day that is the, the, the Pong Blanc Festival. And all of these things, when, you, when I moved to another, uh, to another kingdom or province, I got to understand that 
this form of practice is not only in in one area it's actually in other form, parts of it. but they actually have different the, the, the same uh, concept but different forms of of uh, of carrying the message over there they carry the message of the 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 festival but over here they carry the message of a folk tale and the folk tale is a really huge folk tale that's why the ringlets or the bamboo threads of the the hema northern which is in the west side of the khasi hills they're much more longer but sadly due to the earthquake in 1897 they they actually uh, they were destroyed and when i designed this uh, the data collection that i've gathered all over all around and i designed this book and designed this uh, thought process i actually had this uh, visual that i've designed and the when you look at the upper part the colored part it's the colors that of the hima khairan the the ones that i the first data collection the ones that notifies about the 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 festival we had every element over here constructing it and when we go down, down further when we go down towards the the other visual part of the the book this carries the the, mess, the the other form of practice of the west side so that's one of the principles that we we usually do in order to carry out these messages information for the public and when we think about living root bridges one of the other projects that i did it's actually um it's we wanted to connect with people on the uh, the topic of sustainability what is what do you mean by development can you can we term that as architects we 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 always see big bridges skyscrapers all of these uh, big big metropolitan cities do do we really term them as developed or do we actually step back and understand whether you know like what about natural beauty can it be termed as uh, development so when when i went there uh, to the living root bridge i actually understood that there's a lot of uh, structurally i'm really bad at structures but <laughs> this is one of the analysis that they have tensile strength and the bridges carry a lot of compressive strength and towards the bottom and the roots and the branches play an important role in actually uh, in actually making this uh, bridge last for 300 300 to 500 years and now when you go into the field of data collection it's important to actually note each and every de detail so what type of bamboo what type of, or is it a betel nut trunk and when and you gather and you ask a lot of questions along the way where why do you do this uh, do they split the bamboo and actually put in soil and manure around the way so that the roots can actually have a lot of uh, so as say a lot of nutrients along the way when they grow and develop and you actually analyze between the early life bridge and the mature bridge and so we wanted to uh, after gathering all of the all of this information we we wanted to actually cater to the people because uh, research work sometimes remain just research for no one reads it but how do you how do you how do you communicate how, what is your purpose of the research to educate people about sustainable development so we have a structure for the narrative that we we are working on in iit bombay that the community work the process of making reasons behind the making the myths the beliefs the social, the social structure and lastly the preservation on how are we going to put all of these points for people to understand with a lot of brainstorming and a lot of um, a lot of thought and concept development we we achieve at uh, a form of conversation or story storytelling engagement between a grandfather and a granddaughter in which he teaches the granddaughter how to make the bridge and why do we need to preserve the bridge and and how do we how do we use this form of instruction so we children loves to read comics or have uh, to see animated films or to see cartoons so that's when we wanted to use all of this narrative in the form of an instruction and in the form of a tale and a graphic novel so here you can see that the, the grandfather is teaching 
the child. And there's a lot of questions from the child to the grandfather saying that, why can't we make steel bridges that we see in the city? We have the money, right? And that's when the gra grandfather is like, you know, we should be, uh, we should all seek towards uh, which will benefit the environment. There's a quote from Gandhi. Uh, he, he was like, nature can fulfill everyone's need, not everyone's greed. That's when we use the line of Mahatma Gandhi and then actually carry on the, the, the narrative and actually amalgamate the narrative and the design together. And that's when the, the, the tale follows where the grandfather teaches the granddaughter on how to actually use this instruction on how to tie it and how to weave it along the way. And along the, the way also, we wanted to showcase the, the society so we, you, we actually inculcated all of these female figures in, in the story and in the nar narrative so that people will also not, under, not only enjoy the story, but actually get a sense of the social structure here that is the matrimonial society. So all of these characters that play an important role in the narrative are actually women so that we can show and give a sense that this is actually what, what one of the major plus points or one of the major factors and cultural aspects of the region. And when you go over there also for research, it's not really about uh, the architecture I'll be done. Okay, fine. You will find a lot of inspiration in the ecological, as, uh, in, the, in the natural aspect also in nature. You will find fishes, you will find uh, flora and fauna that actually will cater to your design. You will understand why such species exist in that form, in that particular geographical condition, condition. And these have been designed by God himself. So taking inspiration from the design by the Almighty into your own design is one of the key factors that we need to, to, to actually keep in mind. The same goes with flora and fauna. The understanding, understanding what, uh, flowers are actually present in that region and what actually why why does this hornbill have this type of uh, beak is it because of the climatic conditions and why do these clouded leopards live only on trees is it because there's so much uh, trees over there and you have to question yourself as you go along the way because you have to cater to many aspects in and we are moving towards a, a, a climate change type of scenario where everyone is actually looking forward to actually preserve the environment. That's one of the key factors that architects and designers need to keep in mind that nature actually is the key, uh, is the key factor that we need to preserve in today's world. Now, when you visit there also, you have to notice even the dustbins, even the dustbins, how, how people are actually using, you, you know, just like when I said earlier, this was actually used by farmers to gather yeah, crops from, from the, uh, from the fields, from the harvest, but as time went by also it can be used with this modern concept of dustbins. So in the villages also they have all of these dustbins so you can inculcate in your sketch. And then you can have, you can actually click photographs of the indigenous architecture there or you can make a simple sketch over there and actually inculcating into your narrative. And when you actually understand how the, the the structure is and how the interiors are. You can actually use all these images in actually conceptualizing the narrative and the storyline for the project. And these are other key factors in which you can click photographs and musical instruments. And that's when you use all of these shots. Maybe it's for a documentary film or feature film or graphic novel or any other design that you might be really uh, into and actually take inspiration from there. And one of the major points also they need to use and ask people around there is the, the tools that we use in order to construct or to help out in conservation of the natural habitat. You, you, and then in actually understanding all of these tools, you can actually use them, you can pick a few of them and actually uh, represent your data in, in your data collection in a very graphical form. And even like uh, for kids children, what type of food do they eat and what are the types of indigenous uh, food habits that they have, you can actually use them as the one of the key factors to support your design later on.
Now, when we go towards my field of user studies and user experience and user uh, interface designing, now we have one of the major importance, this is actually uh, what I want to tell the students, is that from the very start, you need to narrow it down the topic. When you have a concept, for example, let's say you have architecture and art conservation, that's a very good idea. But as you go along the way, you have to understand which location are you particularly wanting to conserve. And when you see that location, which, which subjects do you want to conserve? Is it the marketplaces, is it the religious places, institutes? And further break it down, if you say markets, which part of market, which part, how many years has it been here? So when you have to all, uh, you, when you have to pick a topic, you narrow it down little, little by little. Otherwise, at the end of the day, you will never complete your work. And when you use, uh, when you go for data collection, when you go for data collection, it's always wise to have an empathy map. I don't know if any one of you knows what's an empathy map, but I'm going to tell you, it's a kind of a pattern, uh, you divide the page into four parts. Let's say you have says, things, does, feel. So this is the user that you've been on, uh, trying to gather the information. Let's say you go towards to, to one particular museum that's very old. So you, you question, let's say you have this person named as Jasmine or any, what do you expect in the new design? What do you think of the new design? What is the size that is best for the new design? Do you like the brand that we have? That is all the, the, the information that you can gather when the, the user says it. Now, what does, the th what does the user think? Do you think I'm stupid? Or you know, do you think that the design is stupid? Do you think that it's really awesome? Or do you think that it can be, uh, you know, you can develop it more? Or do you think that there are certain missing pieces? Or do you think the architect or the designer they didn't actually pay attention to the cultural aspect? So these are the, the thing. And then does, when you go to the form does, you have, this is like the doing. So you have to check all the pros and cons in the design. You have to compare the product that you have created with other ongoing products worldwide. And then you have to actually get uh, observations from other people around you. That is, you ask friends, you ask your peers, you actually make good decisions, small decisions. And then when you go to feel, when you finish the design, how do you feel? How does the user feel? Uh, does the, uh, the user feel so confused? Or does the user feel it's too overwhelming? It's too much of everything? Or does the user feel that, oh, okay, fine, this is the best design ever? Or does the user feel like, oh, I'm so scared to use this design because it looks scary to me? Now, when you get all of these data, you will have different sections of people that are going to talk about your design. Let's say there, there are going to be uh, some who are just 18 or 15 who are going to have their own perspective of the design. So when you group all of these people from one age group, let's say from the age of 16 to the age of 21, you group them as one set of people and you name them in one persona. Let's say you have, this is the persona for 18. You can name that persona. Let's say you say, her name is Rachel. But Rachel doesn't mean that it's a one person, but she's one person that represents the entire 18 to 21 years of age. And they're same. And then you might have people from different sections of society and different people from different age groups. Let's say people who are from the age of 50 to 70. And let's say you name this uh, particular person William. And then you say, oh, this, these are, William doesn't necessarily mean that's one man, but these are a group of people who are belonging to this uh, sections of uh, age group and actually have this form of, uh, you know, all of these, uh, uh, so as to say, all of these facts that regards your design. And then you can actually go in further and actually finding different people of different occupational groups and everything and actually use your data collection to categorize their personas. Now, when you get all of these data, all of these personas and everything, now that you have to actually come back to the drawing board and see the pain points. Pain points is when you see that the users are having a lot of grievances. When you see what is the problem with my design? What is the problem with the, 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 my thought process? 
is there any is this problem that keeps on arising or is this a problem that persists because of the old design that has been done before uh, are there too many problems arising because of this particular problem or does the user need help or is it a minor problem or a large problem that's when you actually put all of these down into paper and actually jot it down from the user's perspective now after all of these things that you've done now you think of your design suppose you you design a hospital you've done really well and everything and everything goes smoothly that's it's known as a user scenario where it's a happy part that everyone is like you know it's happy with your design it's well designed you can go from one point to another point and everything that's when the design goes very well so that's when uh, you know you, you actually understand that you don't need to actually develop any further because you're actually done but there are certain many there are going to be many 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 scenarios that's going to happen the not so happy part where the design has flaws and the design the user satisfaction is not up to par and the designer uh, the design actually needs more inputs that these are the things that you're going to gather from different people who are going to use the design for example if you were to use to design a school so you're going to have all of these user scenarios for the principal the principal goes from his car to the principal office to the uh, you know school platform and back to his office that's one scenario the teachers when they get from the car they go to the school from the school where they go to the classes from classes they go to the staff room and whereas for children there's going to be different scenarios children go to class class they go have lunch break they go to the playground they go to the toilet they go this 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 that so there're going to be a lot of user scenarios and you have to actually jot it down into different uh, different user scenarios to actually make all of these uh, the design as the best as it can now once you finish all of this design and then you give your presentation let's say in class and in your college and that's when you 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 get all of these reviews from your jury you get from your teachers you get it from your peers that becomes another user scenario that's when your teachers come into being people who has been in this field for a very long time they're going to tell you okay this is not how it's supposed to be in everything use that as another form of user scenarios where the people or the experts or the people who has designed school or who has designed other uh, products in in their life are actually giving these inputs so um i want to ask if there is any other form of question i'm going to show you about about some of my uh work so over here also when i did my data collection it's this one so um how we design the book also in order to understand how do we get to the users we have all of these uh we introduce first the project and the location of the project and that's when we give a prologue or the introduction of the cultural practices and everything that is around that area and once that is we introduce the state formation the political state formation of the area and once we go with that we talk about how we have narrowed it down to one particular to one particular uh, area or the province and we studied about we have different types of provinces in that particular land but we are focusing only in one province for now and that in this province we notice the architectural elements and in the architectural elements itself also we understand there are other elements that cater to the rituals or they cater to the different cultural aspects of the land and we actually go on further to actually understand who made all of these uh, uh the design back in the day and even into this very day and this is how we actually use the information and the data collection in actually to make people understand about our field of study and i'm going to show you about this other part uh, for the living group bridge and how we did 
it's a form of graphic novel, like I showed earlier, that we have the different elements here in the villages, and we inculcated all of these uh, indigenous practices and their work wise. And we see the conversation between the granddaughter and the grandfather. And we inculcated all of these uh, tools and snacks in the graphic novel. And in order to actually get a clearer idea, we take inspiration of the people who are still working there and getting the when we collect all of these data we we don't just put it there as data we, we make it interesting in the form of a comic strip where the conversation takes into uh, another form of uh, you know, so as to say a narrative or a folk tale that will cater to the understanding of why the need of preservation of the environment and the the effects of why of deforestation, the, the use of flora and fauna, fauna in, the, in, the, in, the, in the indigenous beliefs, and so on and so forth in understanding what are the impacts that if we go on to kill the environment and actually construct more and more uh, things that will only cater to the destruction of not only the environment but to the whole uh, human uh, mankind itself. So um, uh, I just want to ask uh, if there's any questions that the people would like to ask. Yeah, hi Pascal. How are you? Hi. Hi, <laughs> hi ma'am. <laughs> Okay, it was very nice talking to you and listening to you because uh, you know um, every everything else in India has been explored, but it was a very different uh, you know perspective from your um, presentation I got and it, it was very wonderful representation of art of Khasi tribes and the way you have put forward uh, through that egg you know egg uh, yes. kind of aerodynamics protecting the board was very fascinating I never knew that. And uh, I just wanted to ask you some of the questions like, uh, what are those distinctive characteristics which uh, make uh, these Khasi, Janiti, and Garo uh, tribes unique from each other? Yeah. Unique from each other. Unique. Yeah. Um, so the, the people of the state of Meghalaya, uh, especially in terms of the social structure, we belong to uh, the Kasi and Jantia, they, they belong to a material society. That's one of the major uh, so as you say, cultural difference from other parts uh, of the society in the world at large. We, we, so there's a difference. People always have this uh, uh, misunderstanding between matriarchy and matrilineal. Matriarchy is when the woman actually takes control of everything, but it's not the case here. Uh, here is a material society where the lineage or the, the, the inheritance and hereditary or the family or everything goes from the woman. So that's one of the, the key factors that, uh, the, that's really different from other parts of India and in the world. And one of the other parts also is it's actually inculcating like we do not have a script. So as say Bengal has their own Bengali script, you know, Devanagari they have. The Chinese, Japanese, everyone, they have their own script. Even Manipur has its own script. But the Khasis do not have that. So how, what do they do? How does you know, tradition pass down from one generation to another? We have been living this in this world for a very long time now. So without writings, how do we survive? It's when we actually use nature. We use all of these, uh, so as I say, the, the waterfalls, like uh, in the Sora Cherupanji, the heaviest rainfall in the world. We see the waterfall, and the waterfall talks about a folk tale, about a mother, a distraught mother who committed suicide. These are very, very uh, scary types of narratives that is inculcated with the environment in, in terms. But these are actually the paved way in actually people to understand more about the social structure. Even if they can't write, just by looking at uh, nature itself, they can understand. Uh, the rules and regulations and the structures written in nature itself. So that's one of the key factors also. Okay, uh, so this was uh, with the comparison of whole India, but I was asking about it, how Khasi, Janitya and Garu, all of these three are uh, different from each other, unique from oh, yes. each other. Okay. Yes, 
one particular part is uh, the unique is the language itself. Because when you think about in the state of Meghalaya also, uh, when you move from, you may have the same language but different dialects. So in, in one, for example, if I'm here and within a range of 10 kilometers, the dialect actually differs. Each of them have their own uh, ways of speaking. It may be the same language, the pronunciation or certain aspects of the dialects or the linguist actually differs. When you go to the Jajanja Hills also, they have their own ways. It might be similar, but there are certain things that really, really differ. And in, in terms of social structure also, the, the Garus have the different ways of uh, the, the governing their own land and the Kasis have their own, the Brahms have their own. And it's like, uh, so it's like where the, uh, one of the key factors also, the Jaintias and the Kasis are quite more similar in that way in other parts, but then the Garus are much more different because the Garus, uh, the language is quite different uh, holistically speaking from the state of Meghalaya. And when you think about the descendants also, the Garus actually in history, uh, so there's no defined research till now, it's an ongoing research about the origin. But we are from Kasi Janja, they come from the Mon Khmer language, so as you say, Southeast Asian, one of the austro asiatic languages, whereas the Garus descended from northern part and from Tibet and coming you know, migrated from there. We came from Southeast Asia. So that's one of the key factors that is actually uh, different. Okay, okay, very well. Uh, Pascal, one thing I was uh, what I was wondering, like I was going through the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Garo is one of the UNESCO's World Heritage Site, I guess. But why Khasi? Because of having so much uh, blend, the mixture of indigenous cultures and the you know other histories. Why still this has not been included in the UNESCO's World Heritage Site? Any ideas? Um, so, um, so there are different things that are. Uh, among to that, one of the th one to three re uh, like reasons, it's like there's a lot of, uh, so as I say, in terms of there's a lot of ongoing research fields also in, because, because I have friends who are archaeologists and everything, many of the projects are, so as I say, in other, uh, they take a lot of time, so as I say, in terms of, because they have to cater to different things. For example, in some of the excavation sites here also are actually religious sites where uh, you know, the indigenous religion plays a very important role. For example, some of the hill where they, they understand that it's it's the descendant, where the Kasi descended from there. So it's a holy and sacred uh, space. In order to carry on all of these, uh, these findings and everything also, that becomes a lot of hindrance also for, for the, the, the daily practices and everything. So it might take time. And certain aspects also, when you think about the Kasis, also some of the origins, some of the excavations are in the parts of Bangladesh. That is literally in the other country. For example, we, when, before the partition of Bengal, we actually had a connection to Silhet and everything. And one of my friends is actually using, uh, you know, excavating sites both in both parts. So it's, so, so something that deals with that also becomes, uh, you know, a hindrance in slow process. It will come a time where it's going to be happening, like the government, yeah. but then I think, I can gather till now is one of the major reasons for that. Yeah. From my archaeologist yeah. friends. Okay. Uh, one last question I, I have is that all these paintings which you have drawn, the it it was through your imagination or experience because you know I understand because many of those cultures um, might have the extinct, you know. Yes. Then how you have uh, understood those, uh, and you have drawn. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is a question that I've been asked very, uh, very often from people about imagination and art and data collection. So um, one of the major parts, that's when we understand no, that uh, art and design is, they relate, but they're different because art can be a form of self-expression. You can just create art and say, this is how I feel. No, no one, if you want to judge, judge it. There's no right, there's no wrong. But if you're a designer, for example, like me, I use illustrations as a design to actually use these illustrations to cater to the people through books, through uh, graphic novels, through different sets. That's when you need to think on in terms of the designer. 
and in terms of the user. So when you actually use the, uh, the, your thought process, as uh, so you don't keep your feelings anymore in front, it's not about you. It's not about the artist anymore. It's about it's about how uh, this the audience are going to react. Am I communicating the right the right uh, facts and figures to the audience? Am I getting each and every detail right from from the looks, indigenous looks, from uh, from even the posture, from even the the jewelry, from even the clothing, the social structure? Am I getting it right? That plays a very important role. And yes, imagination plays an important role because back in the day we didn't have uh, cameras, right? We do not have all of these uh, so as say, films and everything. Unlike many parts of India, where you know in the 1800s also when Mumbai, Mumbai has already been really ahead of us. We have already seen so many things, and Kolkata also had the Satyam train and everything. We in the parts of Mughalaya, we still uh, have, we are still in the development phase of of art and, and design. So what we did was is like we get all of this information, we read all of this information, and we we actually use to represent. So as I say, we present what we've read into a visual form. And there are books uh, uh, that are available. It's called uh, Sketching from the Imagination and how you can work from it. You can have this imagination, but how can you actually use the same imagination to, to communicate the right facts and figures to the audience? So that's one of the key factors. Oh, thank you so much and i must say that as a as a as an architect and as a heritage lover this was an you know eye opening session because this yeah. is very you know there are unexplored things still unexplored yeah. things about yes. these hills and these cultures so yes. thank you so much thank you so much ma'am <laughs> been a long time i've met you yeah 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 <laughs> So are there any other questions? Hello, Mario, sir. How Hi. Are you? Hi. That was unexpectedly. Uh, uh, Ekjot, can you? Uh, Ekjot. The full picture, and I am sure that. Ekjot. Audience present here would have yes, sir. It was uh, just a moment, huh? Just uh, if you can hold on for a moment. Ekjot, if you can just hold on for a moment. So hi, Mario, sir. This was really a wonderful session. Uh, many of uh, our students are actually very good artists, but this transformation from you know a basic skill of sketching to what actually design is is very mm -hmm. much required so the transformation mm -hmm. from the art to design so that is what you uh, you know taught yes. uh, us today like a lot of research is required uh, if we actually want to transform it from yes. basic art to what design is because art is just my expression and design is yes. uh, you know uh, we are taking into consideration the the end user also so I'm sure this is going to be a very much, uh, uh, you know, uh, great session for my students. Over to you, Ekjot Kaur. I, I just want to add one more thing that the there is a way forward in, in your lecture that was that it, how to implement your research was the key factor which yes. I like the most. Because many people do the research <laughs> in their papers, but they are not able to implement on site but uh, this was really um, a good session and, and it was a learning session as well <laughs> thank you thank so you. much so we will ma'am we will request mario ji to have this uh, art and architecture session number two very soon <laughs> yeah yes. it can be it can be a workshop it can be a workshop for the end it can be a workshop yes it'll be nice over to you Ekjot. That can be a wonder lecture, and I am sure the audience present here would really have learned a lot. Now, I will introduce architecture assistant to the GNDC School of Architecture for Thank speech. 
ladies and gentlemen a very good morning to all it gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this event to all the dignitaries assembled here i would like to thank and congratulate our guest architect mari patel for his expert lecture on art architecture and design thank you sir i would like to thank the principal head of department professors and students of gurunanak dev engineering college school of architecture my audible okay somebody removed me from the meeting okay so i i, I would say that I, uh, my special thanks to um, architect vivek segal for his efforts to connect architecture students with the practicing architects around the nation also special thanks to dr arvind singra and architect navneet bhatia for gracing us with their presence once again i thank you all thank you so much mario ji for thank accepting our invitation thank you all for being present yes, here yes you can call any time teachers from different we'll have to thank you thank, thank you good day thank you for the students event Yes, thank you so much, students. All the best, because like after architecture, also you'll be finding a lot of things that you want to do. Actually, for me, also after 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 architecture, I went to IIT Bombay. Had to connect with so many people from engineering, from biochemistry, from medical, from anything. Like design is like, you, as an architect, you'll have to connect with so many people. That's in in your after graduation. There's a lot of people who's going to be working with you. So all the best with that. Even thanks so much. Time till then. It's a bye, my side.